intro gets me pumped every single time. I think it's that like emphatic symphony. Like, mm. uh, but I'm pumped to be up here today. Uh, Pastor Chris and Lori are actually on a cruise today celebrating their 15th wedding anniversary. So they aren't here today. We give them a round of applause for that 15 years. That's awesome. That's a heck of an accomplishment. Uh, so Pastor Chris asked me to preach this morning, uh, which uh, after he told me what movie it was, uh, I was glad to accept the responsibility. But uh, if you haven't been here with us for the first couple weeks, we're in week four of our series at the movies, as Sammy said. And uh, basically, we're just pulling biblical truths out of these stories, out of these movies. Uh, if you read the Bible at all, you know that Jesus himself used illustrations a lot when he was talking and uh, preaching to his followers. Uh, so we model ourselves after Jesus and figured, hey, why the heck not? Plus, we get to play some movie clips and serve popcorn. So why not? Um, so for week one, we talked about Wonder Woman. And uh, that was awesome. Pastor Chris encouraged us to choose love. Week two, uh, we had hidden figures, and he encouraged us to be a generation of sign smashers and to stand up for racial equality, uh, amongst other things. And uh, week three, last week, uh, was Hacksaw Ridge, which I don't know if anybody else uh, will admit this, but I had some awesome leaking out from my eyes. I guess my awesome ducks were too full because it was, it was pretty dusty in here, and uh, I was, yeah, yeah it, was, it was emotional for sure. Uh, well, this week I have the pleasure and uh, uh, the uh, privilege of being able to talk about one of my favorite movie franchises uh, of all time, and this is a, a story that happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and uh, you can probably guess already that we're going to be talking about Star Wars The Force Awakens this morning which uh, when Pastor Chris asked me to preach, I don't think I let him finish speaking before he said, can you preach on Star Wars? And I cut him off and was like, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is a direct sequel to the original trilogy that was released in the 70s and 80s. Uh, this follows up a couple years, several years after Return of the Jedi ended, which was the third of that trilogy. And uh, in it, you have some of your classic characters. You still have your Han Solo, your Princess Leia, your Luke Skywalker. But it also introduces a cast of new characters that uh, become the main focus of, of the, the movie itself, one of whom will actually discuss his story uh, this morning. Morning. Uh, but just in case you aren't familiar with it, uh, let's take a look at the trailer. Who are you? Who are you? I'm no one. I was raised to do one thing. But I've got nothing to fight for. about what happened. It's true. All of it. The dark side. A Jedi. to you. Just 
want to throw that on instead of watching me preach today? <laughs> um, yeah. So as I said, uh, this movie introduces a whole new cast of characters to the Star Wars lore, um, one of whom we'll be discussing today. Before we go any further, though, can you do me a favor? If you consider yourself like a, a Star Wars nerd, a f fanatic, if you will, can you just raise your hand for me? Just identify yourself. I am one of them, too, so I'm, I'm fine with admitting that. Okay, great. Now, if you didn't raise your hand, look around and look at the people that did raise their hand. If, if at some point, so as I was planning this sermon, Pastor Chris's one ask of me was that I not get too nerdy, that I not get into names of planets and alien races and kyber crystals and how lightsabers are built and all of this. So uh, I promised him that I wouldn't. But if I happen to slip into that, do me a favor. If you start to feel yourself maybe a little confused, a little lightheaded, palms sweaty, something like that, just go ahead and throw your hands in the air. And one of those Star Wars nerds will be happy to walk over to you and kindly explain to you exactly what it is that I'm talking about. Because if there's anything that Star Wars nerds likes talking about, it's Star Wars for hours on end. Am I right, Star Wars nerds? Yeah? All right. I'm just kidding, of course. I'm going to try and keep this as uh, interesting as possible today. But as I said, we'll be discussing one particular character, uh, and that's Stormtrooper FN2187. And some of you are ready to already throw your hands up in the air. Like, all right, I'm lost. Stormtrooper FN what now? Like, what are you saying? So uh, Stormtrooper FN2187 is who the character that we'll be discussing. And don't worry, his name changes later, and we'll discuss that in a second. But Stormtrooper FN2187 is introduced in the very first scene of the movie. We see him have this battle of conscience. And we don't have the actual scene for you today. But he has this battle of conscience. He's working. Uh, a Stormtrooper is the rank-and-file soldier for this evil organization known as the First Order, and the First Order's uh, determined that they're going to take over the galaxy. They want to rule the galaxy with an iron fist, and it doesn't matter who they have to kill or destroy to do it. So FN2187, as he's known, is one of the soldiers that his responsibility is to carry out their orders. So in this very first scene, he has this battle of conscience where he sees innocent people being slaughtered uh, for the purpose of gaining power. And he realizes that he can't, he can't participate in this with a good conscience. He doesn't want to do this. He needs to get out of the First Order. But leaving the First Order is easier said than done. He can't just walk up to, the, to his captain and say, hey, I'm leaving. Um, he's, in, he's in an army. He's a troop. So uh, he figures out that he has to find out some way to, to escape, to, to defect from the Stormtrooper army. But unfortunately, he realizes fairly quickly that he can't do it on his own, that he needs to enlist somebody else's help. And uh, in our first clip, we'll see uh, him interact with somebody that he believes is this person uh, that, can, that can rescue him, that can save him. Let's take a look. I'm serious. We can just throw on the movie if you guys want to watch it. FN2187, or later as his name is changed to Finn, recognizes Poe really is the only person that can help him uh, escape, the, person, the only person that can help rescue him. And, and not only does Poe reward him by helping him escape, he gives him this new identity. And as I was planning this sermon and uh, thinking about some different biblical parallels, I was discussing this with my brother Liam, and uh, he actually suggested a parallel between Finn and one of Jesus' disciples. Um, so if you have your Bible with you today, you can turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. Uh, it's the first book of the New Testament. If you don't have your Bibles with you today, it's okay. There should be some uh, around here in the theater. Um, you can use your Bible app on your phone, or uh, it'll also be up on the screen behind us. But I thought this passage, and this is where we'll be staying today for the duration of our time, uh, really rang true with uh, a lot of what, what goes on in Finn's story. But if you uh, go down to Matthew uh, 16, verse 13, it starts, it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. It's interesting here because 
Jesus starts out this interaction with his disciples by asking them who other people are saying Jesus is. And I don't think Jesus asked this question simply because he was interested in what the local gossip was about Jesus. He, wanted, he didn't care about what other people were saying about him. He asked this question for a point. I think it's revealed when he doesn't respond to them by, saying, by, by really responding to what they're, they're saying about him. He asks us questions of what other people are saying about him, but ultimately, Jesus really only cares about, and it only matters, when he asks you, who do you say that I am? You see, we all have people in our lives, whether it's family members, relatives, uh, people we've seen on TV, celebrities, uh, philosophy teachers. We're all going to come in contact with somebody at some point that's going to give us an opinion, their opinion, on who Jesus is, right, wrong, or indifferent, They'll probably have an opinion on, uh, on who Jesus is. But really, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is when Jesus asks, asks you, who do you say that I am, what your response is. Not what your grandparents believe that he is, not what your father believes he is, not what your friends believe he is, but what you believe he is. So Jesus starts this and asks this question for a reason. And Simon Peter, Simon son of Jonah, as he's known here, uh, responds, and he's the first person to speak up and see and acknowledge who Jesus truly is. He sees him as the Son of God, the Messiah, the one who's promised. Just as Finn recognized Poe as the only one that was able, able and capable of saving him, of getting him out of his mess, Peter acknowledges Jesus right away and sees him as the Son of God. And Jesus responds not only just by acknowledging and confirming what Peter said as correct, but he also rewards him with a new identity. I thought the parallel between that and what Poe does for Finn, Poe doesn't only uh, confirm what, what Finn thought about him, that he was a pilot that could save him from his situation, but at, when all is said and done, he helps him leave behind this old identity of his, his stormtrooper name. This was the only thing he ever knew, the only name they ever gave him, but he helps him cut ties with his past he helps him cut, leave that, that stormtrooper life in the past, and Jesus does the same thing with us. When we recognize and acknowledge his true identity, Jesus rewards us with a new identity. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 puts it this way, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed. Behold, all things have come new, become new. When I preached back in January, um, I talked a lot about this idea of uh, finding our identity in Christ and the importance of that. And when we recognize and acknowledge Jesus is the only person that can save us, the only person that can get us out of our mess, not only does he rescue us from that, not only does he grant us eternal life with that, but he also gives us this brand new identity. He calls us sons and daughters of the Most High and co-heirs with Christ. And the Bible is filled with things more than conquerors, things that Jesus calls us once we accept him and acknowledge his true identity. Later on, in the movie, we catch up with Finn, and he has his new identity. He's escaped uh, from the First Order, but he's now faced uh, with a choice. He's asked to stand and fight against the First Order, and um, he knows this organization is evil because he was a part of it. He knows what they've done and what they're trying to do, um, but standing up and fighting against them isn't an easy choice to make. Let's take a look at our second clip. You are right. So we catch up with Finn, and uh, it's interesting because at first in this clip it appears that he's direly con or su super concerned about his, his friends and whether their safety, and uh, he really encourages them all to run. It looks like he's really caring about the well-being of his friends. But as the, the character Maz, as she looks closer at him, she sees truly his concern ultimately is only about himself. He's looking to save his own skin. Finn, at this point, chooses the easier path, runs away because he's scared, because he knows how difficult the fight will be. He was a part of the First Order. He knows what they're capable of. He knows what they'll do to them. He's seen the evil things that, they're, that they've done, and he places his own well-being, his own health, and his own survival above everything. He chooses to run away. If you flip back to our text, uh, Matthew 16, skipping down to verse 21 now, uh, we see Jesus interacting with his disciples right after this conversation he has with Peter. 
And he goes on, he says, uh, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. That he must be killed on the third day be raised, and be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, I know that response that Jesus has initially comes off as being super harsh. Like, you can imagine Peter just coming alongside after he hears Jesus talking about his death. Like, we've all had that situation where our friend is telling us something and it's real doom and gloom, and we come alongside them and we're like, hey, don't worry, it's not going to ever get that bad. It's all right. And that's probably, honestly, what Peter is thinking in the situation. Like, Jesus, like, don't worry, they're not going to kill you. You're, you're super awesome. Like, don't worry about that. Um, but Jesus recognizes that Satan is actually using Peter in this example as, as a stumbling block, as something, as a way to tempt Jesus uh, uh, out, of, out of what Jesus' destiny is, what the plan is that God has for redeeming mankind. Jesus knows clearly because he's prophesying here before Peter comes up to him, talking about the things that he's going to have to face so it would be very, very easy at this point if I'm human and I know tomorrow that I'm going to face uh, a brutal death that includes mocking, beating, uh, my friends abandoning me, uh, and, and I know that's going to happen tomorrow, no matter what the reason is, temptation is going to be pretty strong for me to avoid whatever it is that's going to cause that. In the same way, Jesus knows what's going to happen to him. He knows, he sees what's on the horizon. He knows exactly what he has to face, the weight of the cross. So for somebody to get in his face and say, hey, Jesus, that's not going to happen to you. You don't really have to do that. that that's, that's a real temptation for Jesus. We tend to think of Jesus because he was God in a bod here on earth, that he didn't face temptation, that he just kind of floated through life in his 33 years, and then he went to the cross, and it was, it was kind of painful, but you know it was okay because he was God, and then he came down off the cross and came back to life and went to heaven. It was okay. But Jesus spent 33 years on, on earth here as a man. It says he was fully God and fully man, so that means that he faced the same temptations that you and I face every single day. So when somebody comes up to him and says, hey, hey, Jesus, you don't really have to face this heavy burden of being beaten and, and bruised and spit upon and mocked and humiliated and abandoned. Like, you don't really have to face that. The temp Jesus knows the temptation for him is real. And it's interesting because Jesus gives us the blueprint right here for avoiding temptation. He, it says, uh, if you Go back to verse uh, 22. It says, Peter began to rebuke him, which means that he started to and Jesus cuts him off. He doesn't allow it. So that as soon as that temptation begins to creep in, Jesus cuts it off right where it is because he knows if he wavers for even a second, he would truly consider possibly not doing the thing that he knew he had to do in order to redeem all of mankind. He knew that if he even considered or wavered for a second, there was a chance that Satan could win. And Jesus knew that that was never an option. He loved us too much to ever let that be an option. So he cuts Peter off right at the, right at the start there and tells them, hey, you're not, you're not thinking about things uh, as, as God thinks about them. You're thinking about them as, as man does. Instead of running away from his death, Jesus ran towards it. Philippians 2, 6 through 8 in the New Living Translation puts it this way. It says, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Jesus knew what would have happened if he had had second thoughts about going to the cross. And he wasn't about to do that. It was more important for Jesus to save our skin than it was to save his own skin. Thankfully, as so is true in, in so many of our favorite stories, Finn's story doesn't end with him running away and being a coward. Uh, his story uh, is redeemed. And as we'll see in our last clip, even though Finn chose initially to run He's given a second chance to stand up and fight 
the first order and do the right thing. Let's take a look at our last clip. I know a lot of people are going to be watching Star Wars this week. <laughs> this time, Finn has recognized that life under the rule of the First Order is really no life at all. And that if he truly desires a chance at a life, at real life, he must be willing to put his own life on the line for that chance. In this scene, he comes face to face with the leader of the First Order, Kylo Ren. And he knows he stands little to no chance at defeating him. Kylo is far more skilled at using a lightsaber, far more powerful in the force. But his focus is no longer on saving his own skin. He knows it's about something much bigger. It's about surrendering his own comfort, his own health. What he feels is safe in order to have a chance at truly living. He knows his life will only begin once the First Order is defeated. Jesus goes on in Matthew right after this rebuking of Peter. And he's talking to all of his disciples and he tells them about what truly living looks like. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life will for me will find it. The New Living Translation puts it this way, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Jesus says, guys, it's not about you and your comfort and you running your own life because that's not real life. It's actually not life at all. Jesus says the only true way to live is to follow his example, to take up your cross and follow him, to put the ultimate goal of glorifying God above everything, above what you want, above saving your own skin. Not to be concerned with your own personal happiness and your comfort above those things, even if it means going to die on a cross. It's about living like Jesus lived. It's about learning from him. It's about doing what he said to do. It's about putting your own wants, needs, and desires aside and acknowledging him as Lord and Savior. Recognizing that a life outside of him really is no life at all. In our clip, Finn chose to put him, his friends and others ahead of himself in that scene. Jesus calls us to put him above ourselves. So what would it look like if we actually did that? What if we as followers of Christ made a constant habit of denying ourselves, our own comfort, our own wants? If we put that aside and said, okay, Jesus, what do you want? What is it that you say that I should do in this situation? Even if it's uncomfortable for us, even if it makes us feel like we have to put our lives on the line. What if we put our needs aside and instead ask Jesus to tell us what those needs should be? What if we chose to deny ourselves and simply follow Jesus? What would the impact be on our community, on our church here, on our, on our community here in Baltimore, on our relationships with each other, with you, at our places of work? What would that look like? And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you don't you don't know Jesus. You don't have Jesus as your personal savior. And you're, you're sitting there and you're saying, man, that sounds terrible. That sounds really difficult. I don't know that I want to sign up for that. I think I'm pretty living a pretty sweet life right now. And, and that sounds really difficult. Well, I'm not going to be dishonest with you. It's not easy. Denying yourself is pretty hard. But I compare it to exercising. Anybody else? here not like to exercise? If you didn't raise your hand, you are lying in church. Let me rephrase that. Anybody here like the sacrifice that it takes when you exercise? Okay, you guys need some help. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's painful. There's a lot of sacrifice involved in exercising. 
you have to say no to your time or to get to sleeping in late or to not going straight home after a 12-hour day at work or uh, saying no to the, the cake in the break room. or, or it, it, There's a lot of pain in that. But you know what I've never heard? I've never heard somebody say, you know, I regret all that exercise that I've done. I really wish I hadn't burned all those calories. It was, that was a mistake. I should have instead eaten that whole bunch of, whole dozen donuts and sat on the couch and watched Netflix all day. Never have I ever heard somebody say that. No one likes pain. No one likes the sacrifice that it takes to exercise. There's pain in the no. There's pain in denying yourself. But at the end of your day, after your denial, you enjoy the success that comes from your exercising. It's the same thing with denying ourselves control over our own lives. When we deny ourselves and and choose to follow Jesus, when we decide that Jesus has the final say over everything, true life is found in that place. I guarantee you that while denying yourself and following Jesus will not be the easiest pain-free choice of your life, you will absolutely never, ever regret it. It will be the best choice of your life. If you think you've been living the good life now, just wait till you follow Jesus because life is truly lived in surrender to Jesus. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus and you're feeling something today, you feel like you wanna make that decision in just a second, we're going to give you that, that chance to say yes to Jesus, to, say, to deny yourself and to recognize him, who he is, who he said he was. Because today Jesus is asking you, who do you say I am? And you have a choice to respond. You can say, you're just a nice guy. I'm Lord of my life. Or you can choose to deny yourself and acknowledge him as Lord and Savior. Or maybe you have given your life to Jesus you did that a long time ago, but recently you feel like maybe you haven't been denying yourself so well. We're going to give you a chance to rededicate your life in just a second too. So if you will with me, take a posture of prayer, bow your heads, close your eyes. We're going to give you a chance in just a second. If you think that you want to make that decision today, if you're deciding that you want to deny yourself and follow Jesus for the very first time in a second, I'm just going to have you raise your hand. No one's going to be looking around. No one's going to call you up on stage. No one's going to make you get up here and say anything. This is just a public recognition of what's going on in your heart. It's between you and God just to say, you know what, God, you are Lord. So if that's you this morning, I just want you to remember three things. I'm going to count to three on the, thir- on the third thing. You can go ahead and raise your hand if that's you today. First thing I want you to remember is that Jesus loves you with an unconditional, everlasting love. Two, denying yourself and saying yes to Jesus, you will never be the same again. And if that's you today, if you will, just raise your hand. Raise it high in the air. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. One, two. Three, four, five. Awesome. Awesome. See you up there, third tier. Awesome. Awesome. You can go ahead and put your hands down. That's awesome. Thank you. Praise God. If you today are here and you're saying, you know what? I need to deny myself. I've already given my life to Jesus, but I need to recommit. I want to recommit today to Jesus. Can you do me a favor with people still heads bowed? Eyes closed. Just stick your hand up in the air. If you want to rededicate your life to Jesus today, just go ahead and throw it. Awesome. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Praise Jesus. Awesome. You can go ahead and put your hands down. Yeah, with our eyes closed, just repeat after me, front to back, side to side. Everybody say this prayer together. Say, Dear Jesus, I want to know you. I want to give you room in my heart. Thank you for choosing to love me. Thank you for your grace. I confess I cannot do this on my own. I need you. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's put our hands together for those.
first time here, uh, we would love to give you a gift, uh, this wonderful, beautiful mug. Please see us over at the Next Steps table. And if this is your second time here, we have this awesome t-shirt, which we would love for you to have as well. You can stop by the Next Steps table, see Lorelai or I and the team that will be there. And thank you so much for your generosity, your giving. Uh, the new tithe and offering boxes that look like a steel vault are sitting over there, as well as we want to encourage you about online giving and text giving as well. So thank you so much. Let me close you out with some prayer today, guys. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much. Uh, God, you are so awesome. We thank you for your love. We thank you that uh, you did not uh, choose the easy route, Lord, but that you loved us so much that you went to the cross and died for us. Lord Jesus, we praise you and we thank you for everybody that's here today. We thank you for the hands that were raised today. We just ask you to bless our day, bless our Sundays. We disperse. Bring us back here safely next week. In your name we pray, amen. Love you guys.